Father, thank you for the opportunity again this evening to gather together and just please help us as we study your word tonight. Just help us give us wisdom and understanding from the text and make us uh, more like the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Well, the last Sunday evening that we were together, we covered 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, and we saw the blessings of knowing God, being saved by the grace of God through Christ. We saw the characteristics of the local church and the individual Christian during times of persecution. And Peter reassured the believers that the best life that we could possibly, best way we could possibly use our lives is if we use them for the glory of Christ. And in terms of the world standards, it will not be the best life because we will not be loved by the world or indulging in the sins of the world. However, it is the best because we know God Himself and we live to bring glory to Him and we will spend eternity with Him, being judged by Him ultimately. And so the best use of our life is truly to spend it in service to Christ the King. And that was an important reminder for the believers, especially in the context of going through persecution, for them to be reassured that they were on the right track, that they were taking the right path. And now tonight we come to verses 13 through 17 here in 1 Peter chapter 3. We face the reality that we very well will be targeted for the sake of that which is righteous. But how should we respond? How do we give a defense of the faith and proclaim the truth of biblical Christianity to the lost world? Well, let's read this text together here this evening. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ might be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Now, there are a couple of primary points to notice about verse 13 here. First of all, no human being can truly harm us in the end if we are Christ, meaning that they cannot touch our eternity with the Lord. Uh, that is a wonderful source of security for us as believers as we're going through difficult times. It should give us confidence and boldness to move forward uh, without wavering, but instead holding fast to the Scripture. When going through persecution, that reality is important to keep in the forefront of our minds, that our eternity is secure in Christ. Secondly, this verse is communicating a general reality in that if you act with good character, you will often not be hurt by a hostile world system. And if you're one of those helping others who are in need, seeking to do what is best in whatever scenario, trying to love others unto the glory of God, in many cases you will not experience the same type of treatment that a criminal would. That's not true, obviously, in every context. We know we talked about this morning how the Canadian government is starting to come against biblical Christianity, and we see the hostility that they are enacting towards believers. However, in many situations, lost people will not try to physically harm you when you're actually doing that which is good. Not always true. Certainly there are exceptions to that general statement. But the question is, what do we begin to do if they actually are inflicting suffering upon us? Because we're holding to that which is righteous. How do we take a bold stand for the Lord in that moment? Well, look at verse 14 here. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. We see a couple of important points here in this verse. 
First of all, we are called to make sure that we are actually suffering for that which is righteous as defined by the Word of God. Now, obviously, that can be a lot of things. It could be a stand for the true righteous gospel of Jesus Christ, that the unbelieving world is actually persecuting you for proclaiming the gospel message. Then again, it could be for the definition of the biblical family. It could be because you're involved in discipling someone else so that they may grow to maturity as a believer. It could be for any number of things, but whatever it is that we are suffering for, we must be certain that it is for that which is righteous as actually defined by God. Secondly, here we see the blessing upon those who suffer. That is a fundamental change in perspective for us, that we often think of suffering as a dreadful thing to be feared, but Peter here calls it a blessing. It's not that we're going out intentionally trying to be persecuted. Rather, we go out intentionally doing that which is righteous for the glory of God. And if we end up suffering for that, then we can know that we are blessed. But why would suffering, why would persecution, why would it be considered a blessing? Fundamentally, because it is bringing you closer to God by chipping away at you, increasingly working to sanctify you in Christ. James put it this way in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so really the trials, what they're doing is they are working to produce, to work character in us. That is one reason that they are a blessing. Another is that they allow us to glorify God in a unique way. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 5 with me here quickly. Acts 5 is a well-known incident where the apostles are commanded not to teach Christ. They disobey and they end up suffering for it. And I want you to notice their reaction in Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 42. Acts 5, 40 through 42. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. So we see here that the reaction of the apostles to suffering is that they actually take joy in the fact that they were given the privilege of suffering for the sake of Christ. That it really is an honor to suffer for the Lord, if you think about it, because He has suffered on our behalf. God sees our suffering, and He will not neglect it on the last day when He judges us. He will reward in full all who are in Christ, and He will not neglect to reward those who have suffered for His sake. And so for all of these reasons, suffering is a blessing from God in the perspective of a biblical Christian. It's something that we should not be ter terrified about or needlessly anxious about. Instead, we should seek to be faithful through it. Now, I want you to notice the last part of verse 14 here. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. One of the temptations whenever we're looking at a hostile world is to give way to fear and to worry and to anxiety. That we look at the difficulties coming our way, we look at the evil sins of the lost world and the perverse standards that they are living according to, and the response of our flesh is to want to be afraid. However, Peter here calls us not to be in fear of them. Don't lose sleep wondering if you're going to undergo persecutions and what they will be like. Don't, don't spend time in anxiety and depression over the state of affairs. And don't waste a single minute of your life worrying about the suffering that the lost world wants to inflict upon you. Such things are a part of the Christian life. But how can you overcome this fear? Uh, let's be honest, the fear of man is one of the hardest things to overcome. What is the remedy? Look at verse 15, the first part. 
But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. This really is the foundation here for living fearless before men. Some translations will say, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. The, the idea here is that we are to honor Christ as the Holy Lord. That we are to have a deep understanding of His power and His holiness, which would lead us to not fear men. Because if you have a proper fear and respect of God Himself, then you will not be concerned with this puny little creation known as mankind. Instead, you will understand that it is Christ who is in control of all things, that he governs all things by the counsel of his will, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. He is the Lord over all, and he has saved you. And so this reverence, this honor and respect for the Lord, it is the foundation for us to be rid of the fear of man. Because once you understand how great and how glorious Christ is, then man's judgment and opinions are not truly significant. Not even the pain that they can inflict upon you. Because you see that any suffering that you undergo is for the glory of Christ. It's according to his sovereign plan. Not only these truths, but also the reality that it is his pleasure you are seeking should cause you to not fear man. You want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, when you meet him in glory. You're not concerned about the the fainting applause of man. Instead, you want to live a life that is judged as faithful by Christ himself. And so because you live for his glory, for his pleasure... And his joy, knowing that it is his judgment that matters, this causes you to lose your fear of man because you're not concerned about their displeasure. Your primary concern is about whether or not your master and your savior is pleased with you. And specifically here, you'll notice that that Peter points to the holiness of Christ in verse 15. He he is the Holy One, meaning that nothing impure or sinful or evil is in Him. He is the sum of all perfection and contains all of the glorious traits of righteousness. Because He is holy, that means that nothing that is unholy can ever enter His presence. That is why we as Christians had to be made holy by the atonement of His blood, by the atonement of Christ, where we are saved by Him. That is, means that we will flee from our sins, that we will flee from our evil ways of rebellion, that we will uh, not be concerned at the judgments and the sufferings inflicted upon us by lost men. Because we know that they are sinful and they are living into a rebellious standard, actually rebelling, rebelling against the Lord. The holiness of Christ, it, it should prompt us to be holy in our own lives. And knowing the reality that He has saved us and that He is at work sanctifying us. All of these truths are bound up in a proper fear. And the honor of Christ leads us to not fear men. But how do we begin to give a testimony to the lost world? How do we defend the faith whenever we're standing there receiving all of this hostility because of persecution and suffering? The first point, as we see, is to give Christ a proper reverence, a proper respect. Uh, This means that we're going to need to speak the complete truth without wavering and with the proper attitude as commanded by our Lord. And secondly, I want you to notice verse 15 says this, Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Uh, This passage makes it very clear that we are to be always ready, that we are to be always prepared to make this defense. Uh, This means that we as believers, we need to study the word to know how to proclaim the truth. We need to study the word, not, not just for the sake of our own souls. Yes, we need it in our own souls. We need the truth of scripture, but also so that we might know the truth to proclaim it to others, to defend the faith against the attacks of the enemy. We must seek a deep knowledge of the Scripture. Uh, That's what it's going to take to honor the Lord by standing firm. If you don't know the Scripture, how are you going to know how to defend the faith when it is necessary? If someone asked you when you went outside of this building tonight what the message of the gospel is, could you tell it to them with clarity? If they had questions about Christianity, if they had questions about the faith, could you give them answers because you know the Scripture? 
All of us should seek to know the Bible to such a degree that we can give these answers, that we can speak the truth to those who need to hear it. Another point here to make is that you and I are called to open our mouths. That might sound obvious as we're reading through this passage, but let's be honest, it's a bit of a difficult point here. You see, we can come to church, we can develop all of this knowledge in our heads, and, and that's a good thing. But the knowledge that you learn is not meant to stay in your head. Biblical knowledge is meant to be lived out. It's meant to be applied. It's meant to be spoken to the law so they might come to an understanding of the truth of Christ. And so defending the faith necessitates that we are not only ready, but we're also willing to speak the truth to those who are lost, that we are eager to take up this task. In fact, not only to the lost, but even to those who are hostile, to those who are inflicting suffering upon us. That is the entire context of what Peter is addressing here, those who persecute us for living righteously. And so if, if someone is persecuting you, if they're acting in a hostile way, the response of Peter is that you need to honor Christ, you need to defend the faith, you need to testify to the truth of the hope that lies within you. That takes a lot of courage. That takes a lot of strength from Christ for us to be able to give this kind of an answer in the midst of a hostile situation. But it is the calling of the believer. In the last part of verse 15, we see the moral character of this defense. It says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Whenever we defend the faith in this type of a hostile situation, we're not called to be flippant. We're not called to act in a prideful or arrogant way. We're not to be mean-spirited. Peter says to be gentle, first of all. That, that type of an attitude is going to prevent you from acting in spite and in anger towards others. What would promote gentleness in us is the fact that we understand the kindness God has already shown to us. Uh, that we were once a lost sinner, and so we can be gentle towards other lost sinners while we are proclaiming the truth. We do this out of a heart of love for our Lord that flows into love for those to whom we are proclaiming the truth. Our goal is that we want them to be saved. We want them to repent of their sins. And so we demonstrate an attitude that is Christ-like while proclaiming the truth of his word. Secondly, Peter says to be respectful. Or actually, you could translate this phrase as to fear. I think primarily the fear of God is in play here. The respect that we have towards him. But secondarily, undoubtedly, we are to have a basic respect for our fellow human beings, as seeing as they are God's creation. They are made in his image. And so we should give them basic dignity and respect. And this prevents us from spouting off rashly or saying something in a fit of rage and anger that we would regret later. Because if we really fear God, then we're going to seek to be intentional in the conversation, trying to honor God and to show respect to the person. For example, if you think about it, if some high-ranking official from the state of Oklahoma were to come in here. I don't even know what your opinion of them would be, but most likely you would show them a, a basic degree of respect because of the position and the office that that individual would hold. Not that you would hold back from telling them the truth, but that there would be a certain amount of intentionality that you would have in that kind of a conversation instead of just spouting off mindlessly. Well, as Christians, we should show basic respect in every conversation because we know that we are under the eye of God being watched and we will be held accountable by Him. Therefore, whenever we're talking with our persecutors, even, we should be bold and unwavering in our declaration of the truth, but also gentle and respectful. Now look at verse 16, which talks about the testimony of a faithful life here. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. It's truly amazing how many noted preachers and teachers have one of two issues. 
on the one hand, they may be very nice individuals who are not practicing any kind of gross immorality or anything of that sort. But you find that they're not very strong doctrinally. They're, they're not really rooted and grounded in the text of Scripture. So they, they may not be committing adultery, but they're not theologically sound and stable as they should be. They're just not as deep as they should be. On the other hand, you will have those who teach a doctrine that sounds biblical and, and all that they say seems to be good, but then you actually find out that they're living something completely different behind closed doors. Then, of course, you have the preachers and teachers who are shallow in their doctrine and immoral in their living. Both of those things are true. In a similar way, you and I can give a defense of the faith that, yes, it accords with biblical doctrine, but if we don't have our life in check, then we're not living completely for the glory and honor of God. Our conscience is, is to be informed by the Scripture as our God-given mechanism to tell us when we are in sin and to repent. And Peter wants us to live in such a way so that when we stand before our enemies, we may not have any immorality to be ashamed of in our lives. Uh, live righteously in the Lord, and you won't have to worry about your enemies digging up some hidden area of your life. Uh, live holy so that you aren't worried about them going back and discovering that business deal where you acted in some sort of a shady way. Uh, live this way so that even those who slander you, who bring all kinds of false accusations against you, might be put to shame through your good behavior. This is one of the primary goals of the Christian. It is especially important in terms of standing up in times of persecution and giving a defense of the faith. Peter is wanting us to understand the reality that we must speak the truth and we must live according to it. It's not an either or. Either you speak the truth or you live faithfully. It's a both and that we're to do both of these things and they're equally important. If your opponents are slandering you with accusations, they should not be able to find any evidence for those false claims because you should be living faithfully and not sinfully. And that is why we must seek to inform our conscience according to the Scripture by the power of the Spirit of God so that we can live in a way that is free from guilt, truly living in obedience to His commands. Now I want you to notice the last verse here, verse 17. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Peter, Peter here is bringing us home to our foundational point within this section of Scripture. The foundational point that it's suffering for doing that which is good is better than suffering for evil. In other words, because we acted in a wicked manner. And the key point comes in when he says, if that should be God's will. We are called to submit to the will of God. The, the reality is that none of us controls our own destinies and our own futures as much as the world would love for us to believe that we do. God controls the future himself. He controls everything. He is the sovereign one, not us as frail human beings. And so whenever we suffer for doing good, we can see the work of God in that. We can see that it is his will. And we can submit to that will seeking to be faithful. A lot of times a why me attitude develops amongst individuals going through difficult times. That kind of a mindset shows a failure to comprehend the will of God. Because in reality, we as Christians understand that we should be in the flames of eternal hell right now. Even the most torturous of human devices cannot touch the pain inflicted by the wrath of God in eternal hell. And so the fact that not only are we not in hell right now, but as believers, not only will we never be in hell, we actually have been given the blessing of being a part of the kingdom of God for eternity. These realities should prompt us to be willing to be faithful in the midst of suffering. We understand that God owes us nothing. Everything that we have is a gift of his grace. 
It is a gift of the abundance of his kindness and his mercy towards us. And therefore, we humbly submit to his will whatever comes our way. Will it involve difficult situations? Well, yes, oftentimes it will. But we have the promise that God will be there in those moments to strengthen us and to encourage us in such times for his glory. We can know the truth that it is he who has the infinite wisdom, that it is he who knows best. And whenever we look back from eternity and we see all the twists and all the turns in the paths of our lives, we can know that he has taken the course that is perfect and right in planning things as they went. Even those paths that involve suffering and persecution and difficult trials for us. We will see the depths of the perfection of God then as we will never have before. And so may we trust in his holy will, seeking to live with a fear of Christ, giving a defense of the hope that lies within us with an attitude that honors Christ and is backed by the faithful testimony of a life focused upon him. Let's close in a word of prayer here tonight. Father, thank you for the opportunity to study this passage of Scripture. I ask that you would help us to be faithful, not only in the good times, but in the difficult times, and in times of trial and suffering and persecution, that we would joyfully submit to your will and that we would seek to be steadfast in such moments, giving a defense for the hope that you have given to us and living faithfully in every aspect of our lives. And help us to glorify you as we go into this next week. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.